A Participatory Economy, Robin Hanel's new book on post-capitalism, is out now. Thomas Piketty describes it as a key contribution and a must-read. I talk about the book with Robin Hanel in the third part of a special three-part episode of Pep Talk, coming up next. Could you please tell us uh, what you see as the alternative? Hello, and welcome to Pep Talk, the Participatory Economy Podcast the podcast where we discuss the democratic alternative to capitalism known as a participatory economy. I'm your host, Mitchell Strapanchik, coming to you from Chicago. In this episode, we will discuss the final third of the new book, A Participatory Economy, by Robin Hanel, as published by AK Press. I am indeed joined as my guest by Robin, with Robin Hanel, who is joining us from Boston, Massachusetts, in the United States. Um, he is the author of the new book, A Participatory Economy. Robin, welcome to the show. Good to be with you. So we're going to talk about the last third of the book. Uh, we've been talking about the first third of the book, and luckily the book is div- nicely divided up into um, three parts. These last parts are kind of, well, not terribly well connected to what a lot of activists would deem maybe not important or relevant. Um, chapter seven begins with a discussion on what's called participatory investment planning. And chapter eight begins on participatory long run development planning. Um, I, I, let's first make sure we have a clear understanding of what that means. So, Robin, could you take a moment to explain what does it mean? What is participatory investment planning? What is participatory long run development planning? What's the difference between the two? Help us out. This is interesting because. Um, this is where there's big differences between different audiences. If you're talking to economists and you say you want to talk to them about economic planning, well, then they assume that what you're going to be talking about is planning investment and long-term economic development planning. They assume that's the only kind of planning that anybody would ever be interested in talking about. And so, I mean, first of all, notice that we haven't talked about that at all yet. And yet we talked about how one can replace market forces and authoritarian planning in order to actually generate an annual plan for what every worker council and consumer council is going to do and then even go through the process of adjusting that annual plan when unforeseen things happen every year during the year as they inevitably will. What we've talked about up until now um, is of great concern to political activists because they are always thinking in terms of, well, uh, do we want a market economy? Um, If we want a planned economy, how can we avoid you know, the kind of planning that the kind of authoritarian planning that was done in the 20th century by communist parties. Um, So we've talked about all of that up until now, but we have not talked about something that that economists um, assume will be the subject of planning. And the other thing to, to for people to remember before we start is that when we do annual planning, That's already done in the context of having come to some sort of prior agreements about investment and development plans. Because what investment and development plans do is they make the decision about how much are we going to consume in any year as opposed to invest. Invest in what? Invest in replacing machines that get worn out. That's the easiest kind of investment. That's simply replacing worn out machines or depreciation. But we also presumably would want to add to the stock of machines that humans have to work with because that increases people's productivity. And that will allow for more production and more consumption in the future. It's not just machines that we have to invest in. We have to invest in educating the new generation of workforce and presumably upgrading um, upgrading the skills of future workforces so that they will be even more productive. So that's something that we're going to talk about today that it used to be called manpower planning. Um, but fortunately, feminists have come along and said, well, it's not just men, you silly boys. So now the, now the, the, the term for that, which is 
I mean, I mentioned that it used to be called manpower planning because it's something that's been around that economists have talked about for a long time. And that was the old name for it. But we can call that educational planning because what we're doing is we're investing in education. Um, and that's a kind of long-term development planning for transforming the educational characteristics and skills of the workforce. And now what we are painfully aware of is that we need to do long-term environmental planning. Um, and that's also investing in um, protecting and even enhancing the natural environment, um, first and foremost, um, to avoid cataclysmic climate change. There is one other kind of long-term planning that some countries have engaged in in the past, and that usually gets called long-term strategic international economic planning. Um, that's transforming. Any national economy fits into an international division of labor. They produce more of some things they consume and, then, and they export those in exchange for, in order to pay for other goods that they consume more of than they produce, which they import. Well, over time, what many countries have done is engaged in transforming their, what economists call comparative advantages, so that they develop new comparative advantages um, in the production of goods and services that allow for higher incomes you know, to be earned by those who are making them. Um, it turns out that if you simply produce bananas and you export bananas, um, technical change in banana production isn't very, it, it occurs very slowly. And the kinds of incomes you can pay to the people who are the banana farmers don't grow very much over time. On the other hand, if you specialize in the production of well, the Japanese after World War II decided to specialize in the production of steel, automobiles, and computers. Well, it turns out that if those are the if those are the kinds of goods that you're exporting, um, because there's more rapid technical change that goes on in those industries, you'll be able over time you'll be able to pay your workforce. Um, more than if you just continue to produce bananas and bananas and bananas. So these are the kinds of things that economists have paid a decent amount of attention to over the time. Um, so it, it also means that the subject is a little more technical um, than some of what we've talked about up until now. Um, but yet, nonetheless, it sounds like that that technical the technical matters shouldn't nonetheless take away from their importance. And that's kind of what you're actually talking about here is that a new economy should handle these sorts of things and should that's figure right. out ways to be able to address them. If, if you ask, I mean, if you're asking, well, what would you want your economy to do well? I mean, if you're thinking about performance of an economy, well, an economy that decides to invest too much or too little isn't going to perform very well. Mm -hmm. um, and if econ and an economy that decides to invest too much in one thing and too little in another thing, well, that, uh, that economy isn't going to perform very well either. Um, so these are the kinds of issues. Um, what's particular, I mean, the other thing that happens is that we have to face up to problems that we really didn't, conf that, that we didn't confront when, do do when doing annual planning. When we do annual planning, workers councils know what their technological options are for the next year. There's no mystery about that. Um, and consumers pretty much know what they want. But if you're gonna do efficient planning over time, well then you have to know how technologies are gonna change over time. And you also need to know how consumers' tastes are gonna change over time. And the first thing to notice is, well, nobody's going to know the answer to those things as perfectly as workers, councils know what they can, what their technological options are immediately and consumers know what they want right now. So there's going to be more guesswork that's involved in making these plans over future time periods. So one of the big things we have to address is how do you 
how do you do the best job? Two things. Hmm. Who's best suited to make guesses about how much technology, how much cha- technologies are going to change? Who's best suited to make our most informed and accurate guesses about changes in consumption behavior? And the other thing you need to know is since we know we're going to make mistakes when we draw up long-term plans, how are you going to identify when mistakes have been made and then correct, make adjustments in the, so you can adjust the long-term plans in order to enhance sort of the welfare of outcomes? So these are issues that we never faced before when we talked about all the different aspects of annual planning. Um, but all of these things arrive, you know, all, all of these questions and new problems arise. And then there's one last problem that is really formidable. We want people to make, we, we want decision-making input for people in proportion to the degree they're affected. Well, guess who's going to be affected by how much we invest today? Future generations. Right. But they're not around when we have to figure out what are our long, what are our investment plans and particularly our long run development investment plans. Long run development plans, long run inve- development plans are going to decide how much we put into education. Well, a lot of the people who are going to be the beneficiaries of that education aren't even around when we decide how much of it to do. And certainly we have future generations who will be tremendously affected by how much we have protected and enhanced the natural natural environment. What are we going to do about the fact that those affected parties, I mean, we work very hard to figure out how can you, during annual planning, how can you be sure, how, how can you how can you go about making sure that people have at least roughly decision-making input to the degree they're affected? And here we have a super problem, which is we need to enfranchise future generations. So those are all of the sort of new problems that we face when we sit around to, when we sit down to do these things. Yeah, and you wrestle with some of these issues in the book. Um, another one, which is the topic of chapter nine in the book. Um, is that of international economic relations. Um, Here's something that might struck me as a little, I don't know, contradictory. I suppose there's a little bit of an implicit assumption in that chapter in that it kind of assumes that at some point in the future, when there is a better economy, um, that there's still going to be countries. So why are you kind of talking about something that might not exist. Isn't that a little bit putting the cart before the horse and assuming that countries as we know them are going to still be around? Or how are you going to address that? What do you think about that? That's an excellent question. And if we go back in time, if you go back to 1900 and you ask socialists, well, how just how do you think this is all going to unfold? Their answer was, well, as the workers in all the countries of the world, in all the capitalist countries of the world, come to their senses and realizes they don't need this system, that it's a yoke around their necks, workers everywhere will, not precisely on the same date, but more or less quickly, workers everywhere will overthrow their capitalist economies. And we will have socialist economies spreading around the world everywhere. And if that had been what happened, then maybe maybe the subject of nation states, you know, would have become obsolete because that's really what the vision was. And if you go if you go and look at in the you know in the early years of the 20th century, um, you will see that socialist parties assumed, I mean, in Germany. And in the Soviet and and in Russia, when the Russian Revolution happened, most of the Russian revolutionaries assumed that in Germany and then quickly in the rest of Europe, that socialist revolutions would break out. And they did break out after World War I in places like Germany and Austria, but they failed. And those countries have had capitalist economies ever since. Well, I mean, I don't have a crystal ball. And if in the 21st century, what happens is 
that as soon as a few countries overthrow capitalism and launch some sort of socialist participatory economy, everybody else follows suit very quickly. Well, that would be fine with me. I just think it's unlikely. I think it's increasingly apparent if we look at the last 150 years of history that we are going to continue, that what will happen instead is that that anti-capitalist movements will come to power in different countries at different times. Well, that means that one of the one of the one of the questions that any government will face in a country that starts to establish some sort of participatory socialist economy is, well, how are you going to interact with other nation states? And some of those are and there's and there's going to be two there's going to be two important characteristics that these other nation states that will distinguish them and make them different from one another. One is, well, suppose you're suppose you're engaging in international trade or international investment with another country that also has a socialist economy or some sort of participatory economy. How would you relate with them? Um, and then the second question, but is it different than how you would relate to a country that still has a capitalist economy? in terms of carrying out your trade or international investment. And then whether or not you're dealing with other countries that are capitalist or socialist, if you're a socialist economy, you have a participatory socialist economy, there's pro there's still going to be differences in levels of economic development. So sometimes you might be more developed than trading partners. Sometimes you might be less developed than trading partners. So how would that difference matter in terms of how you approached, you know, coming to trade agreements or how you approached engaging in some sort of international, you know, in, in some sort of, you know, international investment agreements? So that's what we do. To, I mean, that, in that last substantive chapter on the Internet, on, on international economics, then that is where we discuss those issues um, along with how can a socialist economy, um, how can it go about improving um, its status in the international division of labor? Um, what sort of guidelines would it have to follow? So those are the issues we discussed there. You were talking about what the few, you, you said you don't have a crystal ball, nobody does, but yet in the hope is that by writing this book, as well as all the many books and articles and talks and podcast episodes that you've done over the years, over your career, over your lifespan. Um, the hope would be that that would uh, encourage people to want to explore this more. Um, and at some point, something would happen that might later down, down the road, change this. How do you foresee a participatory economy to emerge I mean, we kind of talked about this, how, you know, going back in time into 1900 and you were talking about, well, they'll obviously everyone will understand, you know, there'll be some revolution in one or another country. Everyone will see that the economies they're in are unnecessary and they'll rise up and take over and everything will be great. Um, but it doesn't sound like that that's going to be how a participatory economy would unfold or would it? What are your thoughts regarding how an economy like this would unfold? Any ideas, any suggestions, any thoughts? I think there, there, there's a, here, here are two lessons that I think we have learned or should learn, you know, from the actual history of the last 150 years. Um, one is that socialist world revolution isn't going to break out all over the place at the same time. I think we've just learned that that's unlikely. Um, and the second thing I think we've learned is that if you don't think through, um, carefully think through how you want to respond to the different kinds of situations that are going to arise, that when the time comes, um, then popular movements will find themselves unprepared um, to sort of They'll, they'll, they'll find themselves unprepared to make the choices 
that are the wise choices about how to proceed. And I think, I mean, that's one of the things that I that I've learned from the history of socialist revolutions in the twentieth in the in the twentieth century, that it was really for lack of having thought through um, that people went about doing things that led to something very differently than what they assumed would happen and what they wanted. So if I'm right, that what is likely to happen is that governments will come to power in in. In, in, a, in a country here or there. Um, and they will want to try and build some sort of a participatory socialist economy that, that well, then they're going to have to face issues. Um, and in the case of the international context, they're going to have to face issues of how do they deal how do, how do they deal with other countries that are capitalist? How do they deal with other countries that might be similar to them? How do they deal with other countries that are more developed? How do they deal with other countries that are less developed? I think that's something that it's unwise for us not to do pre-thinking on those subjects. And I think there are certain problems that arise. I mean, I'll, I'll give you one very, I'll, I'll give you, uh, I, I'll say, here's one of the obvious problems that, that I raise, address, and propose an answer to in the chapter on international uh, economics. Um, Suppose you're trading with a country that's less developed than you are, but you're a participatory economy. And one of your guiding principles is that people, you know, people should be rewarded according to their efforts and sacrifices. And in less developed economies, people are rewarded less for their efforts and sacrifices than in more developed economies. That's basically what it means to be living in a less developed economy. Well, wouldn't it undermine a participatory economy's commitment to the principle of economic justice if they always drove the hardest bargain they could over the terms of trade with a less developed when they trade with a less developed country? So essentially, what I've proposed is logic. The logic of economic justice seems to dictate that the lion's share of the benefits from specialization in trade should go to whichever country is less developed. And I would argue whether that country is less developed than a capitalist country or less developed than and, and also a fellow socialist country. Um, because if, if, if a participatory economy does not agree, now that doesn't mean, I mean, this is something that, that economists understand. What the terms of trade do is they divide the benefit of specialization in trade between two countries. So you can divide it so that 100% of the benefit goes to one country, or you can divide it, and, and the terms of trade are what do this, or you can divide it so that 60% of the benefit of the specialization in trade goes to one country and 40% to the other. So even if a participatory economy, which was more developed than another country, even if that economy agreed that may 60 or, or 70 percent of the benefits of specialization in trade would go to the other poorer country, that wouldn't mean that the participatory economy that's more advanced is not benefiting from specialization in trade. Mm. They're just getting 30 percent of the benefit, whereas the less developed country is getting so. So what, what we propose is something we call the 50% rule. That the one of the fundamental principles, you know, of a, of, of a socialist economy or a participatory socialist economy is economic justice. And economic justice basically dictates that more than 50% of the of, of the benefits from specialization in trade should go to whichever country is less developed until such time as they catch up. At which point then, you know, then it can be divided evenly. So that's one of the things we talk about in that chapter. Um, another thing we talk about is, well, what about international investment? And there's two kinds of international investment. One is called, one economist called direct foreign investment, where a firm or an enterprise in one country will establish um, a subsidiary that they own in another country. 
and then they will operate that subsidiary and they will literally hire the workers in the other countries as the employee of, of this subsidiary. What that would do, it, it would violate the right of economic self-management of the foreign employees of the subsidiary. And that's a fundamental principle of a participatory socialist economy. I mean, there's two fundamental principles. One is economic self-management, that workers get to decide what they want to do. And the other is economic justice, that people should be rewarded according to their efforts and sacrifices. So what that basically, I mean, what we argue in that chapter is that what that does, it means that no country with a participatory economy should engage in direct foreign investment in other countries. And that doesn't mean they can't trade with other countries. It also doesn't mean that they can't engage in international financial investment with other countries, as long as they abide by the 50% rule. Um, and of course, they should never allow a capitalist business in another country to invest in them, establish a because that would that would deny that would deny the rights of self-management of our own workers and our own participatory economy. So those are the kinds of things that we sort of talk about in that chapter. And if you think about it, it was a subject that many socialists really never addressed in the early years because they always imagined that things were going to evolve in a different way. They always imagined that we were all going to become socialist countries more or less quickly you know, once the revolution, once the world revolution came. Um, and whether or not they thought about huge differences in levels of economic development between countries and how it is that, you know, even a lot of socialist countries, I, I think they, I mean, one place it did come up was the Cubans brought that subject up with the Soviet Union and the Eastern European countries, you know, in the 60s and the 70s. The Cubans said to them, Che Guevara went over there and said, look, we're all fellow socialists, right, guys? And we are clearly here in Cuba, far less developed than you are in, in the Soviet Union and many Eastern European countries. So we assume that the principles of socialist solidarity are such that you will be granting us the lion's share of the benefits from, you know, from trade amongst us. Um, and it was somewhat of a surprise to Che Guevara and the Cubans that the supposed socialist revolutionaries over in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe said, oh, that's a kind of a strange idea. I'm not sure we agree with that. <laughs> right. Um, the very last chapter of the book, A Participatory Economy, you touch on strategy, but basically to talk about the fact that you don't talk about it. Um, quoting from the book, this is not a book about strategy for achieving economic system change. Strategies, programs, and tactics will vary greatly from country to country and will require constant adjustment in light of events as they unfold. Here's the thing I'm, I'm kind of concerned about, or not concerned about, but I'd like to get your thoughts on. Um, that while it's been great that there's been this model and it's been developed over years, decades really, and there's been a lot of back and forth and research into it and a lot, a lot of discussion and writing about it, there's been almost precious little, maybe next to nil, on if, even if you would think that this is the economy you want, how to get there. And I'm just wondering, this is not the kind of thing you have talked about, really, at least not in this book, um, and hasn't really been, at least in my impression, a big focus of yours. But I'm just wondering if maybe that should be more of a focus, not to necessarily paint yourself into a corner to say this should be the kind of thing, but to just talk about the various options at play there. Talk about tactics and trying to get to a participatory economy in light of this. Well, there, you're absolutely right that this book very explicitly says we are not attempting to address issues of strategy um, and tactics, political strategy and tactics. What we're talking about are things like, well, should should people who want a participatory economy, should we should they participate in elections? You know, I mean, this is a huge debate on the left throughout the 50 years that I've been a leftist in the United States. Um, and a large part of the of the left in the United States that I work with 
felt that was a very low priority. Mm -hmm. And then there was Ralph Nader that says, well, do it the Ralph Nader way with the Green Party. And then along came Bernie Sanders and said, that's not working and not doing anything in electoral politics politics isn't working either. So let's do something different. So those are the kinds of things that I'm talking about. And I mean, another big issue is, well, do we work to, I mean, how much of our strategy should be to work within unions, you know, trying to get unions recognized where they're not recognized, trying to work inside unions to make them more democratic and more powerful? Should we work more on issues such as, you know, should we work more on eliminating racism or should we work more on economic? These are things that, so that's what I call strategy and tactics. How much should we create new institutions that start to work according to the principles of a participatory economy? Um, should we, I mean, should you try and organize a union or should you just go out and, and, and create a cooperative, you know, a workers cooperative? These are things that leftists in the United States and leftists every place around the world have discussed and argued about and disagreed about and fought over. And the idea has always been you try and find out what works. You try and find out what the pitfalls of one strategy are to be avoided. And in my mind, all of this is far, all of this is two things, much more complicated and uncertain than thinking through if we ever get ourselves to a situation where we can establish a desirable economy, what should that desirable economy look like? Um, I think it's hard to argue that somehow we are close, that it's, it's harder for me to believe that somebody is gonna come up with the answers to strategy and tactics um, that are as compelling um, and that won't require adjustments um, as compared to you know, coming up with the answers to questions that we've addressed in this book. Um, and the other thing is that I think I, I think the circumstances will vary tremendously between people, between movements working in different countries. So not only is this whole subject area something that is more a process of it's uncertain and require and, and will be debated ad infinitum by different segments of the left who believe that this is more important or that is more important. Um, but that the right answer, I think, will turn out to be quite different in different countries. Um, whereas, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I think the right answer to what it is that socialists really should want you know, once we can establish an economy that's one that's along the lines of what we that achieves what we would like to achieve, um, I think those answers are ones that are more likely to be very similar um, in different countries, even countries with very different levels of economic development and countries with very different histories. Going back to the topic of the model, a, a, a model of a participatory economy, or basically trying to envision a specific model of any future economy, whatever that might be. Um, and comparing the model that is outlined in some depth in this book, A Participatory Economy, compared to, say, um, the books that you and Michael Albert co-wrote in the early 1990s, I'm thinking of Looking Forward, and uh, The Political Economy of Participatory Economics. Um, when you compare those two models, there's a lot of similarities, but also there's a lot of differences. And you would think that especially given 30 years worth of time that you would want to have a model that um, you would think would be expanded and hopefully be improved upon over time. And that a given, it shouldn't be dogmatic about it. Like you right. wouldn't say, okay, I'm going to write a model and this is it. And it's never changing. But at the same time, it's like having that kind of flexibility is great. And yet, other people could say at some point in the past, oh, this is what you're talking about. Use that as a straw man argument against you and say, well, no, that's not really what I said, but you're not being consistent. You see what I'm getting at here? It's kind of like yes. trying to be the, the understanding of a, the changes 
within the conceptual model, but at the same time, people might accuse what you're saying in the past of being wrong or wrongheaded. What are your thoughts about this? I think there are some parts of what there are some parts of what we are proposing now, 40 years later, that are basically the same as what we proposed early on. Um, for example, take a look at the values. Take a look at the goals. So we started out by saying, well, can we identify what the goals for our economy is, what we'd like our economy to achieve, what we'd like it to do and not do? And I think there's been very little change. You know, if you look back over the 40 years, I think there's been very little change on that. Um, there's been very little change on our insistence that um, there is a third alternative. Um, we are not, as 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 Alec Nove argued, hmm. you know, in his famous book in the 1980s, mm -hmm. he argued, look, you either have some sort of authoritarian planning or you have a market system. There is there no is alternative. No third way. I mean, that, that was his. And at the time we read that and said, we've read your book. Um, we understand which we understand the challenge that you're throwing out there. There are a lot of people out there at that point in time in the 1980s who did think there was an alternative, a third way. Um, and he was saying, no, you're naive. Um, get real. And our reaction was, well, we don't believe you're right about that, but we don't think we're naive. We think that if you think about it, there really is an alternative to authority, to a market system in a system of authoritarian planning. Um, and our immediate concern was to try and sort of demonstrate the feasibility of that alternative. Now, if you take a look at that, um, we never addressed the things we've talked about today. Right. We never did, we never addressed long term development planning of any kind. We certainly didn't address environmental planning or even really seriously consider environmental issues. Um, we didn't we didn't really address investment planning. We didn't make any concrete proposals about how that could be done. Um, we certainly didn't talk about any of the new difficulties that it's harder to estimate productivity, how much how much productivity is going to increase or not increase, how much consumer prep, who's going to do it, um, what are the dilemmas of desert. We, we, we never we, we didn't address any of that. So there's a lot new. Um, you could. So there's a lot new that is working out details and responding to criticisms of responding to questions we had not originally addressed, even about annual planning. Um, so there's a lot of doing that and then addressing whole new areas, including, you know, in, including caring labor and and reproductive labor. So what I can say is that it's not like we it's not like we wrote something 40 years ago and have just republished it over and over again. There's some of that. I mean, in every article you have to you have to assume the person reading the article they're reading probably hasn't read anything that went before. Um, but it's 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 been a it's been a work in progress, um, more often taking on new subject areas that were left out in the original conceptualization and the original treatment. I, I actually have an idea along those lines. I'd like to get your thoughts on this. Um, and this kind of stems from an idea um, with regards to my field, which is computer programming, um, where you compare versions of software, let's say. Um, usually, um, a, a computer program will certainly change, but might grow and expand as a result. Um, and so you might actually want to version out so that you have a version one, version two, version three. And then when you're talking about some version of either a computer program or in this case, an economic model, you're talking about some version of the model that's um, dated to 2005 or 2020, 2022 or 1991. So it, you could actually maybe take those, th that kind of versioning 
idea. What do you think about that? No, I th I think that's actually. I think the practice in computer programming of doing versions of a program um, is actually a very good idea. And you could certainly argue that what we have done is sort of made an early version um, that had some imperfections and didn't address issues. And then later versions either make corrections or make something sort of smoother and easier. Mm. Um, or the later versions also expand on what it is that, you know, what is what what's being addressed. Um, I'd also like to say, and I, I'm I'm curious whether you find this to be the case. When you do new versions, mm. I wonder whether you find that version four, the new material in version four is still more subject to having errors. Whereas whatever has been incorporated and has already been in version one, two, and three, at least by the time it's in version four, it's probably pretty much, you know, been thought through more carefully. Because one of the things I have said to everybody concerning the new book, I mean, both of the new books, is there's a bunch of new material in there covering subjects that weren't subject before. The, the subjects that we have covered before have been rather thoroughly vetted people have looked at it asked questions criticized made objections we've made some changes here and there whereas a lot of the material that's in the new books in, in the the subject of today's episode investment mm -hmm. and development planning is really brand new as far as i'm concerned it hasn't been vetted i mean it's now been published in economic journals in a book but that's basically the process we go through in order to get it out there and start to hear what people think. So I am perfectly prepared, uh, you know, to discover that we have more redoing and rethinking work on the new material than perhaps on some of the older material. You're right in that sometimes within the development of software, to go back to that uh, point of contact, that, yeah, newer things, uh, it, it, especially sometimes very newer things uh, might have problems, might break, might have bugs. And so they'll need to want to fix that. It's like the joke that any kind of a version number will sometimes have not just a number like one, two or three, but sometimes also a, a major version number, a minor version number and a patch number. So there'll be something like version 4.0.0 as opposed to something like 4.2.23. That would be the second minor version of the fourth major version and the 23rd patch, 23rd update you did to fix a bug or a problem. So yeah, and the I bring that up because you always want to be careful of something that ends in a zero because a lot of people will think, oh, this is where you're re releasing this out into the real world and there are going to be problems because it, even though people will, you would hope, write and test their materials before they release it out into the world, uh, sometimes people will find things that they didn't expect. Yeah, I, I I hesitate to buy the car that's the, you know, that's the brand <laughs> new. I hesitate to buy the electric car that's the that, that's the first one that a company came out with. But it would be an interesting exercise to maybe take the entirety of the literature of writing about a participatory economy going back from the early 1990s to 2021 with a participatory economy and trying to like retroactively version it. So it's like, this would be version one, this would be version two, this would be version, you know, 18 or whatever it is. And, and to see how, how it may have changed over time. That might be a, a, an idea for the next book after a participatory <laughs> economy. <laughs> well, the, the, the other problem here is that this whole idea did not come out of a single brain. That's true. Um, and ever since there were more than two of us who thought this is a good enough idea, so I kind over time, other people have also come to the conclusion that they like they they like the initial idea well enough to consider themselves supporters, but they also have contributed to elaborating on different parts. Um, so it's it's now something that has multiple authors at yep. this point. And whenever you have multiple authors, there'll be different emphases, and sometimes there'll be there'll be some disagreements. 
mm-hmm. about you know whether or not uh, and what you know whether or not to recommend this exactly or that. I mean, and that's that's also where we've always been very clear. We're not dictating to anybody in the future. We're, 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 we we know that whoever, whatever the future revolutionaries decide to do will be what they decide to do based on whatever they have read or whatever advice they have, you know, they have taken to heart. So I'm under no illusion that the ultimate version that somebody might put into practice something vaguely even similar to it in some particular country at some particular point in time, it's also not going to look like what we're, you know, what we have described and tried to work out. It will be quite different. It'll be the, it'll be what they want. (laughs) And that's as it should be. Understood. Uh, We've been speaking with Robin Hanel. He is the author of the new book, A Participatory Economy, uh, talking, and we've been talking about these uh, this book and topics raised by it um, over uh, the last three episodes. Um, so, and the book is available now via the publisher AK Press online at akpress.org. And this has been Pep Talk, the Participatory Economy Podcast, the podcast where we discuss the democratic alternative to capitalism known as the participatory economy. To find out more, you can visit the website of the Participatory Economy Project online at participatoryeconomy.org. There you can find an online forum where you can ask questions and contribute to uh, the model or ask questions about the book, like the book, A Participatory Economy by Robin Hanel, or anything related to matters related to um, this model or economic vision. Um, There's also an online newsletter where you can sign up and join to uh, get monthly updates on uh, the Participatory Economy Project and the Participatory Economy Model and related issues. I am Mitchell from Chicago. I've been joined by Robin in Boston. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye for now. Good to be with you. Could you please tell us um, what you see as the alternative? alternative. Self-management, democratic control of communities or workplaces, federal arrangements. Participatory democratic planning. Jobs down the mix of empowering your nesting council linked to one Everyone gets to participate in a primary council. Please visit participatoryeconomy.org to find out more and subscribe to our newsletter. And don't forget to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to our channel. Thanks, and see you at the next episode.